Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Jakub, I'm, I'm very delighted. It's a, a true privilege for me to be here. It's my first real visit to the region and talking to an, in a scientific meeting, really, and I'm, I'm so impressed. I'm, I really have to say, also, the, the clinical work that has been done here is a very impressive um, thing. And actually, it's really nice to see kind of Hamburg-style ablations and, and the maps. I'm really, really um, very, very happy. So I trained in Hamburg. I was there for 10 years, and that's actually, I think, where we met first. And I actually see that I, I put my German kind of type slide on here. The PD is not for private detective, but I'm a Privatdozent. It's an academic title in Germany. Um, and, well, you know, I'm slightly German still, so there you go. Um, I also was very pleased to see that you have actually not employed all those ag very aggressive ablation approaches that they are actually out and uh, they are um, used in many centers now where far more than pulmonary vein isolation is performed. And I think a lot of doctors, and I have to say, I, I include myself, we try to do more, and we probably might be a little bit too much. So in essence, and as you have heard in the first talk, atrial fibrillation ablation is mostly targeting at eliminating the initiating trigger. And that was the seminal observation, saying that it, the initial initiating trigger comes from the pulmonary veins, and that's why we need to try to isolate the pulmonary veins. Now there, you could start arguing which way you should isolate the veins, how large the circle should be, and I can, uh, this little sketch here shows basically the evolution of the ablation uh, procedure. So initially we try to ablate on the firing trigger, we waited for the patient to fire from a specific vein, and then we went into that vein and we we ablated that trigger. And it's very tedious. You can spend days, and I've, I've been involved in spending days of waiting for a trigger and trying to provoke something with all kinds of pharmacologic or volume load or you know scaring the patients, all that kind of things. And my Hamburg colleagues are very scary. So, <laughs> But despite that, that didn't really work very well. Plus, actually, veins, and we learned that the hard way, they don't like to be ablated. If you burn inside the vein, you actually risk pulmonary vein stenosis, one of the most recognized uh, complications nowadays. And um, then we started to do the segmental isolation. And you see here the trigger is actually isolated. That yellow thing here <coughs> marks the area that uh, distal from the ablation itself, yeah, the, the trigger or the, the myocyte that actually de depolarizes and, and gives the electrical impulse is still intact, it can actually still do it, uh, but we connect, well, we disrupt the connections to, to the atria, and that actually was much better. You had an acute endpoint. You could see that beautiful uh, spike potential that we have seen in the first, play, um, first procedure, uh, first talk here, um, go away, and it gave us an endpoint. That was very, very good, because putting those, those dots together don't, don't make anything. So we went then on and said, okay, we need to maybe have stay a little bit further away, and we did this one-by-one one pulmonary vein isolation, which essentially, you are, now you can do it with cryoablations, you can do it with laser ablation, you, can, you were allowed to do it with ultrasound until uh, fairly recently, because uh, actually all those balloons are, are not so great. And, and then people that reported pulmonary vein ablation, making that large line here around it, um, we were always discussing, you know, we were always not fighting, but, but uh, generously and gently disagreeing with each other. We always had the kind of a long um, debate here between is that necessary to make this line complete? Can you allow yourself for having gaps in those lines? Or do you actually need to achieve isolation? So that yellow area in here. And I think we finally kind of solved that. I think it's now agreed that we need to isolate the veins. We need to see that the spike is gone. That's the best predictor of, of positive outcome. But then there were a lot of patients that came back, still came back, and some of them had gaps, but some of them actually were isolated. And then people started to do additional lines. You know, again, trying to copy the surgeons that actually started with the whole atrial fibrillation treatment, multiple incisions in the, in the atria. And we said, okay, we can make lines as well. We can try to interrupt potential re-entry circles. And actually all these lines, and then there was something that was called cafe ablations, complex fractionated atrial electrograms. I'm not going to show you um, details of that, but basically it allows you to ablate anywhere where in atrial fibrillation the, the squiggly lines look extensively squiggly. So it's very you know, kind of subjective feeling of where you should burn. And the problem with that is that you actually destroy a lot of myocardium. You lose the contractile kick. You, know, you lose the atrial kick, and that's really where 
I'm very pleased to see that you have not embarked in these very advanced cases where you feel you have to do something beyond primary vein isolation because I think you beca we're causing a lot of problems. Um, we're causing problems if we destroy the connections between the two atria. The Bachmann's bundle is the fastest connector. If you make ablation lines across that line, across that anterior wall here, then you block the impulse between the sinus node area and the left atrium. And if you do so, you can actually beautifully see in sinus rhythm the P wave gets split in D2. Uh, and you can see a fantastic delay. But you've basically made something really, you know, you really sh kind of delayed the activation so much. And there are a couple of other things. So when you make an anterior line, that is really bad. And the appendage comes then very late in activation. In fact, it goes activation goes around the mitral valve and comes from uh -huh. here. If you burn excessively around the veins, you might even interrupt those other additional connections. So that's, I think, is not a good idea to destroy so much myocardium that, that you actually result in a non-contractile, maybe even in sinus rhythm, um, staying atrium. But if you have so much delay or even isolation of the appendage, and this is one of uh, a recent publications here reporting this, when the left atrial appendage gets isolated, you have uh, activation, atrial activation at the end of the QRS complex or not at all anymore. You have a flow problem. You have, you have so much delay that the left atrium becomes a standstill uh, chamber and that you call something, sorry, that is called the stiff atrial syndrome. It's recognized as a consequence of multiple ablations that have basically destroyed so much myocardium that you don't, you cannot relax anymore, you don't kick, the atrial kick is missing, and you don't have the reservoir function. And I think we, we are causing at the moment a, a patient cohort that's going to become a symptomatic and, and I think quite a large scale problem um, in years to come where we cause pulmonary hypertension. And that's fixed, there's nothing that you can do about this because the, the atria are scarred. It's a little bit of what we see at the end stage of, of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we had the chat about this yesterday and this is actually, you know, it's, a, it's the same effect without ventricular hypertrophy. Now my take of atrial fibrillation has actually changed quite a lot. Um, I think we need to learn more about atrial fibrillation. We need to see a more global picture or let's say a satellite picture. At the moment, all of our understandings have been with sequential mapping approaches, where we walk around, let's say, the left atrium in the first place, or maybe also the right atrium, and we collect information, electrical information sequentially, which doesn't give us any, any picture. So this is a satellite um, picture. You can see, I mean, we're all so used to those weather maps, right? If you were standing here on the ground, or there on the ground, or there on the ground, the only thing that you realize is that there's a lot of wind and rain and storm happening. You don't see the whole concept. If you see it from a satellite perspective, you can see it's beautiful. It turns this way around. You can even predict when the wave hits here. And you can actually understand it in a much, much better way because you are remote and you see all the information happening at the same time. And if you see then what happens over time, it allows you to understand. And this kind of simultaneous mapping approach has been actually enhanced very recently. And then I think this is going to be the way of understanding atrial fibrillation. Now, how can we do this? We can do that with different approaches. This is an approach, um, Sanjay Narayan has, has um, shown this um, beautifully with basket catheters. So a catheter that sits in the left atrium or in the right atrium has splines, has, has 64 electrodes. And where those splines are in contact, you basically need a clever computer system behind that so that whilst ongoing atrial fibrillation you're recording the electrograms and then you can try to understand what's going on. And you can see rotors, you can also see where focal triggers are firing in, yeah? but it has a couple of limitations. Um, actually, there's quite an interesting um, overview and this is not the newest presentation, but, but basically you can see focal triggers in, or fo the focal triggers in close to the pulmonary veins, it's actually quite, quite prevalent but that basket doesn't actually map the veins, so it's, you, know, you can basically just see it flying in from that area. Um, you see rotors quite uh, substantially, and you also see that it's not only the, the left atrium, but also the right atrium and the interplay. They had a really substantial amount of conversions by burning on those rotor core sites, term terminating AF, just 
suck into sinus rhythm. And they said they don't have to address too many sites, and actually I, I don't have the numbers here on, on a publication, but it was surprisingly, but by leaving even the pulmonary veins alone, just burning on the sites that maintain atrial fibrillation, you could terminate, and these patients were followed up with implantable reveal devices and did extremely well, surprisingly well. Now another way of doing this is to do this non-invasively. Do that with a body surface approach. Now body surface mapping again is out for many, many years, probably I think 20 years or, or nearly 30 years. But it was so far always just the surface ECG information. Now it can be coupled with the anatomical information. and You can do that with a CT scan. And in the CT scan you get the location of the electrogram, electrodes on the, on the chest and you have the location of the heart and you can with an inverse solution mathematically solve that equation and uh, projecting essentially the, the electricity from the, from the surface towards the heart. So every heartbeat you can actually understand. And that's, um, I think, a very sophisticated system. I'm very fortunate we have it at the Brompton. Um, we have not been able to use it for atrial fibrillation yet, but we've used it actually for a multitude of, of arrhythmias. We have 27 cases, um, the majority of them with other congenital heart disease where transient events, for example, or re-entrance circles, you can actually follow the whole activation sequence. You can look at it several times, and, and we have actually been really successful in using the system. It also allows you to do the mapping on the ward. The patient doesn't even need to be in, in the cath lab yet. You can wait until someone has a triggering of a PVC, or maybe the patient has more than one type of PVCs, and you can map them all on the ward. You can give them, they can stress you, uh, we can stress them, we can give them ISO, we can give them atropine, we can put them on a bike, we can, you know, again, send the scary colic around um, to induce some arrhythmia, and then in, the, in that moment we can bring the patient back to the lab, and then we can have already a kind of a target at site. So this is how it works. The patient gets the, the vest on, gets the scan, and then we see the electrical information um, superimposed. Now this is mapping during atrial fibrillation. I'm very fortunate I collaborate with um, the center in Bordeaux and Meles Hosini was so kind to give me that movie. So this is I think about two and a half seconds of atrial fibrillation simultaneously recording. It's a loop. And you can see things that happen simultaneously. So you see we only have an atrial reconstruction. We have here the tricuspid analysis, the mitral analysis, SVC right atrial appendage, and you would see if you follow the color code, you can see a rotor in the right atrial appendage. I wouldn't look at the right atrial appendage for anything really. Yeah, I wouldn't. And if you would see here how the activation wavefront runs across here, you would say, okay, that looks kind of a, a wave that hits this way. So there's a re-entry going on, and then if you look on this place again, if you look at this, it spreads from here radially. So there's a simultaneous focal firing and a rotor going on. And if you do these kind of analyses several times, so it's not only once, this changes completely in the next five seconds, it's gonna be completely different. But if you look often enough and you have a computer system to help you analyze where those hotspots are, so where yeah, the most stable rotors are, and you can see the rotor core actually moves. It's not stable at one place. It's moving around, it's, it's a functional rotor, it's a functional side then you can actually understand. And then this area becomes very exciting and very Im important. Whereas when we normal, normally approach this patient, we probably would have you know, focused on the pulmonary veins first. Um, interestingly, it doesn't correspond at all to some kind of cafe signals or something. It's, it's just a completely different way of understanding that. And if you, and what I do very frequently, have a catheter here, you can actually see that activation changes. It sometimes it's a bystander area and then it actually starts going really fast. Yeah, but this is a way of thinking that we have a chance to understand that. Now, I've never treated a patient like this. We have uh, submitted to the English authorities and unfortunately uh, it's not CE marked yet so we're going to have a, um, at some time to wait before I can report my own experiences. But we can get basically this kind of mapping information and in these hotspots I think is, um, is going to be uh, very, very valuable to target our ablation really to the age of ablation that this patient has. Now let me just um, move on one more step and say what is actually triggering the trigger wherever that focus is firing from. Let's say it's not the veins or maybe it's, a, it's the veins. How do we understand why is someone firing at 2 o'clock in the morning and doesn't get AF 
but at eight o'clock in the morning, yeah, or five minutes later, they actually get AF. What's what's what is triggering the trigger? And what what is actually what are the influences? Why is someone having just extras? And you can see by Gemini sometimes for quite a while, and then they get AF. What's the what's the change? Is it can it be an anatomical problem? No, it, the fibrosis is always there. The scarring is already there. The late gadolinium enhancement that we're going to hear about is, is still there. It's not going to change within a couple of, of, of seconds. So uh, I think a good candidate to understand that better is the autonomic nervous system. And there must be some, some interaction. We need to just understand where they are. So the autonomic nervous system, you all know that, is, is basically the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. There's also an intrinsic one, which is uh, kind of not really that, that well understood. And the, the normal concept, I make that qu quick, um, is that the parasympathetic fibers come from basically the brain and they go to these ganglia that are on the epicardium, in the epicardial fat pad on the heart. And the sympathetic fibers are thought to be connecting through the dorsal root ganglia. And they would, they would connect here and then they would go directly running basically in parallel with these fibers and the only difference between the two is that this, this neuro, um, the transmitter here is acetylcholine and here is norepinephrine. So that's the only way of this, you know, basically differentiating the two. And we were able to find them. There are, there are anatomical studies about this. They are very tiny structures. They are conglomerated in, in areas that are called ganglionated plexi and they are actually very much around the veins and they are very much around the, the large arteries. And you could see, okay, you know, and I, when I thought, saw that, I thought, okay, great. I'm probably ablating them anyway with the way that I ablate them. You know, they, I seem to be very close to this. So this is the anterior right. You know, so, you know, fine. They're very, very tiny. They're multiple neurons, but they're tiny and they're very hard to, to locate. So if you look at this, this is this five to ten neurons, extremely small. Um, there are people that look into this and it's for a long time um, that, that has been known. But to find them in the heart and see how they connect from those ganglia towards the pulmonary veins is really quite a difficult thing. Now, this is anatomical structures. That's what we're talking. We're talking very, very tiny little fibers. And <clears throat> there's no resolution at the moment to see that. Uh, what we can do in the cath lab is to find them functionally. It's called high frequency stimulation. You can stimulate uh, you can see here the, 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 <coughs> the example. And when you are on the, from the endocardium or epicardium, actually the surgeons do that as well, if you do high frequency stimulation, you can actually um, have a parasympathetic response. You can temporarily block the AV node. And everyone who ablates atrial fibrillation, sometimes that happens. It's slightly scary when it does. In my experience, it does uh, happen quite frequently for the left superior pulmonary vein. And then you have temporary transient AV block proper um, pr pressure drops and, and then you know, you, know you, must be, you must be there. But that's quite tedious. Now there are people that have a lot of patients um, um, and they, they can spend a lot of hours in the cath lab and this is the Oklahoma City group, um, Sunny Jackman and Hiroshi Nakagawa, they, they, they spend days I think. <laughs> <laughs> and they stimulate everywhere and wherever they find them, they find these sites where they can have this positive effect but they collect, I think, 300, 200 points, and it's really, uh, it's not, I think, for common practice that easily. But what they do is, um, once they have that positive effect, they ablate there, and then they add up with a pulmonary vein isolation procedure. And, and this is um, an outcome um, with a follow-up for patients with paroxysmal and persistent atrial fibrillation. And what is remarkable about this is not that um, you have a certain success rate, it's after one month it's 60%. But what you see is that it actually increases, despite the fact that the amount of antiviral therapy goes down. Now, I'm not trusting too many centers reporting atrial fibrillation outcome. I'm very, very, very reluctant, especially if someone presents these kind of super good results. But Oklahoma City, I actually trust. And there are a couple of other centers that have done um, the same, and it's remarkable. There's actually in Jack, um, I think two weeks ago, there was a randomized trial for just going for anatomical ablation in these areas without even testing HFF. So it's, there's, let's say, emergent evidence that this is good. But it's quite difficult. Quite difficult to find these places, and the high frequency stimulation is, a, is, is not that easy. So we thought, okay, we're going to look into this neuro 
um, transmitters, and we're going to look at this norepinephrine. And actually, norepinephrine, you can actually, you can locate. You can locate with a nuclear scan. MIBG is the analog for norepinephrine. Now, until now, you know, my take for nuclear scans was always I got these donut pictures back, and I, I basically looked at perfusion. This is when I send a patient to nuclear scans. But now you can actually, you could always do that, and there's emergent evidence for heart failure patients where you could look at the innovation. But that doesn't give us any inf evidence yet where these um, ganglionated plaques are, are. But with the scanner that I just showed you in the right um, corner, you can actually have a high-resolution scan. It's actually not one steady-state gamma camera, but 10. And you get the whole information um, together, and you can then co-locate that. I'm just going to go forward. This is a case that I'm going to demonstrate to you. And you can, first of all, blank out the, the, the ventricle, and then you can find high uptake sites around the atria, for example, here or there. And you can then, if you combine the nuclear scan together with a CT scan or an MRI scan, you can find those places back. Because the ventricle is very high in uptake. And you can basically just, just in an IT version, or kind of uh, just bring them together. You can register them. So what you get is you get something like this. You get high uptake sites on the epicardium, these dots. And they are superimposed. So you can actually import them in your 3D mapping system. And we did this. I, uh, I can only tell you about three patients so far. And we brought this patient. It's a young patient, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. He's actually an oncologist at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. And um, we tried to go to these sites that were indicated by this combined scan. And we tried to find HFS-positive areas. So this is, you know, he comes in sinus rhythm. We do the first place, and we induce AF. Great. No lengthening of the of the AA interval or RR interval, and I thought, great, that's not going to be so easy. But actually, we could find places where uh, we had a positive effect, where we s slowed the AV conduction you know, substantially, and we correlated that, and negative sites, nothing happens, you know, it just carries on. And we could correlate, and those, those pink dots um, are not exactly where, they, where those epicardia things were, but you, know, you could say, okay, maybe we didn't register it as well, but we could be guided and find these places. And then I ablated on these sites, and that shortened the mapping time and the, the location of these, these places um, substantially. And we had a lot of places, these orange places, where there was no positive HFS. So we had a very good rec um, correlation of these places. I'm just going to go on and say, after I bl ablated for each of these sites for 30 seconds, because I'm not so sure, it's something epicardial, I'm not sure how, how deep I have to ablate, this is with 10, 10 grams of contact force, I continued and did the normal pulmonary vein isolation. And if you do that, you know, these are the red dots where the HFS ablations, and then the white ones are for kind of Hamburg-style pulmonary vein isolation, large circle. And you could say, okay, my circle here, basically would have probably by chance just hit this, this type, this one. Over here probably would have ablated this red area as well, but I would have never ablated here. I would have just not by chance, it was not on, you know, on the area that I would ablate it. Um, I need to go forward. Let's go forward. So after I had done the GP ablation, nothing had happened. The cycle lengths didn't change, nothing, you know, no acute termination, nothing. I isolated the lateral veins, no, no, nothing again. And then I went to the septal veins and I came up this way and AF terminated right here. The vein wasn't isolated at, at that point. So um, again, it's not in a way, you know, here's the GP. That is not the GP, so I think you know it's it's probably not uh, you know, it's not have, it has anything to do with the ganglionated plexa, but you could see termination into sinus wound. Uh, that's when you always feel very nice and, and, and positive, and you say, "Well, you know, I'm related." It's supposed to be a good marker, but uh, you don't really can't you can't really tell. So we're following these patients now very very thoroughly. We try to um, look at the heart rate variability. We're going to do bar uh, reflex sensor testing. So far, I've only ablated three. Some of them had been pre-ablated, and they are all fine. Um, two of them are still on amiodarone. They're, they're, um, one of them is a congenital patient as well. Um, the one case that I've shown you is completely off anything, and we are haltering him now with a continuous halter, um, non uh, kind of the event recorder, for two weeks in a row, and he has nothing, and he can do everything that he wants. So I think for AF ablation, the advances that we need to make, we need to understand. I think simultaneous mapping is going to help us to understand what's going on 
during AF for a given patient, and we can then tailor our strategy. Um, I think you need to understand why it's happening, when it's happening, and I think these connections that we hear about, you know, you can do the renal ablations and then you have a positive outcome on AF ablation, all of these connections with the nurse need to be understood better so we can understand why they start firing and what's the role in maintenance of AF as well. So I think this is an exciting time. I think AF ablation is going to make a step forward to really explain why it happens. Thank you very much for your attention.